panelists and not the attendees. But Michael, there's someone thanking you for a great presentation. <laughs> I, I did see one question further up about biochar and biochar is definitely an you know potentially yes. an important carbon sink. Um, but how you how you turn logging slash into biochar, it's not quite that simple. You need to burn the slash without access to oxygen in order to make biochar. That's my understanding of it. And I'm not sure that's feasible really on a large scale, how you would prevent the oxygen from being available when you, uh, you would have to collect, I guess, all the slash, put it in some, some kind of burner and turn it into biochar. And I'm not sure at the scale that forestry has done how feasible that would be. Uh, while people are thinking, I want to thank everybody for the great comments in the chat. There were, there were uh, questions and comments and conversations happening uh, all throughout your presentation. So that's really nice to see. Um, oh, there's a new question. It seems our government representatives need to hear this. They are the ones who need to be educated and inspired to change policies. How to do that? Can we send all our MLA, MLAs, MLS, this, the recording of this webinar? That might not be a question Michael can answer, but I can say that uh, we do have all of the videos on the, our Saskatoon Public Library YouTube page in its own little playlist. So if, um, we as an organization can necessarily take on that advocacy role, but if you feel like connecting the video uh, with your, your representative, um, that might be a good use of online resources. Oh, a new question. I heard that the PA pulp meal is going to reopen. What would it produce and how would its value compare with the living forest? Well, I have, no, I I've heard, heard. I've heard for, for years that the PA pulp mill is gonna reopen, but I haven't um, heard anything definite. At one time they were talking about rayon, like producing rayon socks. I never knew rayon was a forest product, but apparently it can be made with uh, trees. But I haven't heard the latest about what um, the product is that they're going to produce. But historically, the, the pulp mill, well, in the early days, Parsons of Whittemore, when the government ran it as Papco, it produced pulp, which was sold and could be turned into anything. Um, when Weyerhaeuser ran it, they actually did produce fine paper, like photocopy paper. Um, but I don't know what, what the, I mean, as, as a, basically as a pulp mill, if you're gonna run it as a pulp mill, you gotta grind the trees up and turn them into pulp. And if they're not going into really high quality paper that's making it into books and going into a library for the long term, it's probably, very likely that it's some sort of disposable forest product. Next question. Since the provincial government hasn't done a great job managing the forests on public lands, why do you think the public acquisition of land would actually lead to a forestation in the land in the forest fringe? Well, that's an excellent qualitative point. Trying, the point I was trying to make was at one time, governments did something with intention and with commitment. And long, when you take on land, you take it on for the long term. Um, when you provide 
a short-term funding program. There's no commitment. These programs have what's called a sunset date. And after that date, there's no budgeted money uh, for the program. After that day, the next government can come in and can, you know, cancel that program and not renew it. So I'm just throwing it out there as an alternative. Maybe, maybe the alternative is to have some third party, say the Nature Conservancy, uh, buy some of that land or land trusts buy that land and enforce it. It doesn't have to be the government, but I think um, maybe the landowners themselves could do it, but it, it would have to be made very lucrative so that it's worth more to them as forest than it is growing canola. And in the past, sometimes those kind of programs, people sign up at the beginning but depending on what happens with crop prices, it again at some points, I mean, they had the conservation reserve land program in the United States and people signed up to put their land into grass for 20 years. But as soon as that 20 years was up, they just cultivated all that land because again, crops were worth a lot more than uh, hay, for example. This isn't a question, but just for the sake of me reading some of the comments aloud from the chat, because in a recording, we may not see the chat, chat transcript. Um, someone has recommended the fantastic fungi documentary as some additional um, viewing. There have been lots of recommendations. I've put some of the books that you referred to in your presentation, Michael, we have at the library. I've put some of those links in the chat as well. Um, we'll be creating book lists going forward for some of our programs on the SPL website. So once those are available, I'll pass on the link to Carol and we can start sharing some of those, those additional resources. Um, any other questions from Michael? I have one about easements from earlier. Someone could pop that in. Let yes. Just... So, um, Do you want to read the question out loud before you answer it? So the government can have a program for payment for ecological services, paying farmers to put land back into forests, wetlands, etc. Would this not be a good way for climate action? Certainly it, it would and it should be one of the options on the table. Um, wetlands I haven't mentioned too much, but again, they're another thing that's being drained and turned into the cultivated land, the same way grasslands and forests are. And it's a real, real problem. When you cultivate a former wetland, you will again release lots of carbon to the atmosphere. So if we could um, pay private landowners to do that, um, yeah, but I think we need multiple strategies. I think we need programs to pay farmers to voluntarily do it. We need programs to acquire land either by the government or by land trusts or the Nature Conservancy or groups like that. We need a variety of different options. Um, not put all our eggs in one basket. And I just think we need to be more serious about it over the long term than so far um, the government's just been fishing around for who has land, who has trees, who might have a nursery. It just seems very loosey-goosey to me. So another question uh, about my dissertation. It's available yeah, where is your dissertation available? <laughs> Yeah, the University of Saskatchewan website. 
Uh, if the library, if you look at all theses, you'll find my thesis, just Google my last name Fitzsimmons and the word deforestation and it'll pop up. I'll try and find that link. But next question was, is there a way the government could put a price on the carbon released by deforestation? How do you feel about that? Well, in a, in a certain way, I, I, I don't think that there should be a price per se. I mean, that gets into the whole issue of carbon credits, which I don't really like that concept because you know, if you go on a flight or you knock down a forest or something, release a bunch of carbon, that's certain that you're going to release that carbon whereas you're paying someone else to, um, to maybe grow some trees that might make up for that carbon, but it might not either. And um, so I think there should be a requirement that land needs to be set aside. So if you want to knock down a quarter section of forest, then you need to actually acquire, you know, it should be even more than one to one. It should be say three to one. Then you acquire three quarter sections of land and you put them back to trees. Um, otherwise it's not a, a fair exchange because you're taking land that has a standing forest with all that carbon and you're gonna release that to the atmosphere, knock it down and burn it and um, even if you took a, a one more quarter section and planted some trees, the trees might live, they might not. You know, who's to say 20 years from now, 50 years from now, whether you keep that forest growing or not. So I think we need a policy. I think there needs to be a strong government policy that no more converting native prairie to agricultural lands, no more converting wetlands, draining wetlands and converting them to agricultural land, no more converting um, forest agricultural land. I think we have enough agricultural land. We're having to work really hard to sell our, our products. Look what happened when China decided for a while not to buy canola. Then all of a sudden we're bailing out the farmers because they have too much canola. So I think um, by, by reducing to some degree the land base, um, for agriculture is not necessarily a bad thing. And um, another way to do that is we have more and more of the land base is set aside to grow feed for animals. And it's an inefficient way to feed the human population, to take all this forest land and grow hay or have cattle grazing. It's just um, ecologically, it's not efficient. The second law of thermodynamics um, applies and you, you get less energy and carbon um, when you, the more uh, trophic layers you go through. Okay, um, next one, question. I am not sure that these excellent forest management alternatives will be feasible or permanent until there is an economic model through which these alternative forest management outcomes create measurable financial value. Do you have any ideas of how these forest management practices will pay for themselves and be self-sufficient and not rely on public funding? Well, I'm not, I'm not an economist, an ecological economist, and I'm sure that there are, there are books out there um, that talk about these sorts of things. But again, I just go back to values. We need to challenge the value that money is everything, markets are everything, the private sector is everything, private land is, is um, sacrosanct. We need to challenge these things because where is that getting to? Where is that mentality getting us to? It's getting us towards climate breakdown. And loss of biodiversity, loss of land access by Indigenous people. That's where that's just taking us further. Do we want to go further and further down that road? 
we have to fundamentally change our values and then we change our decisions as consumers we force governments to change the decisions they make as regulators actually do regulation right now the provincial government is more of an agriculture booster and, and a forestry booster than it is uh, agriculture regulator and forestry regulator and so we need to put pressure on on governments the governments usually follow they don't lead and we need to have some ideas and uh, we'd have to do more research to find out how what type of economic systems we might imagine but we have to let our minds be free of the constraints that have led us to this point and start to dream of those different systems. Um, I'm going to take a break here uh, and invite Carol to come back. Uh, we've got more time to do questions after, but I want to uh, get some information on our next series topic and session. Um, let me just see here if I can pull it up. And if you want more information about upcoming presentations, they're all on the Saskatoon Public Library event calendar. Um, and if you follow the Facebook group for the Saskatchewan Environmental Society, they'll also post all of the Zoom links for the upcoming presentations. And there's Carol, do you wanna speak a little bit about yeah, what the yeah. next one is? Yeah, I'd like to uh, let you know that uh, about our next two upcoming events. And then after that, we probably won't have any until September. So um, the next one is on April 6th. So it's pretty soon, earlier in the month than we usually have them. And uh, it's on plastics. Uh, plastics, we can't recycle our way out of this. And our speaker is the executive director of uh, the Saskatchewan Waste Reduction Council, Joanne Fedix. So it should be quite interesting. And then um, in May 11th, so this uh, May is actually in the next, um, program guide, not in, in the current one, because May is part of uh, the May to August uh, program guide of the library. So on May 11th, um, there'll be a presentation uh, on uh, small modular nuclear reactors on, on the issues around these proposals. And the speaker will be Ann Coxworth, um, who's a nuclear chemist and uh, um, involved with the uh, Saskatchewan Environmental Society. Um, so I, I think I have two, two very interesting ones coming up. So that's April 6th and May 11th, both Tuesdays, and they start at 7 p.m. as usual. So I, and it was a wonderful session here today. I really, really appreciate uh, the uh, presentation you made, uh, Michael. You're welcome. <laughs> so I, I think we can go back to questions now. Yes, I've put the link to the YouTube playlist for our other presentations in the um, chat chat box. Uh, this presentation won't be up for at least a week, depending on how quickly my computer uploads it. <laughs> and sometimes that's a challenge. Uh, Arbor Week, one of the panelists has pointed out in the chat, Arbor Week is May 28th to June 6th. I didn't know that. We were looking up days before we started the webinar and I didn't know until recently, May 29th is learn how to compost today. You don't actually have to compost, but you can learn about it. Uh, any other questions for Michael? I posted a link to your dissertation in the University of SAS Saskatchewan catalog. So if you were hoping people wouldn't find it, it's too late. I have direct linked to it. Um, you might have to scroll up to see that.
All right. Well, thank you again. This is another great presentation. I'm glad that your bandwidth uh, allowed you to join us, Michael. We have one more question. Uh, how can we continue this conversation and strategizing to really see afforestation happen? It's a good question. Do you have wow, other avenues for people to continue? Well, that's that's a good, very good question, and I don't have any quick and easy answers. Um, Kathy Holtzlander just mentioned about yes. you've got blog called protectourforest.ca and there's lots of information there and there's a network of people that are quite interested in protecting forests um, but i think we need to yeah you know, we need to talk um, amongst ourselves and figure out ways to try and put political pressure on political leaders and change the direction that um, the dominant paradigm of development uh, here in Saskatchewan is it's been a very long history of this utilitarian, you know, any land that's not producing a crop is wasteland sort of attitude. And we need to really uh, educate people so that they don't think that way and educate our politicians so that they can value some of these natural assets that we have or, and can even restore and um, get people to believe in climate change. I mean, this vote that conservatives still can't vote over 50% that climate change is real. I mean, it's, it's just incredible. So there's so many different fronts that we could work on. And uh, if, if somebody else has an idea of what we can do, then um, let's get to it. Here. Uh, SOS Trees Coalition wants to get an afforestation project happening with the city of Saskatoon, Miwasan, or whoever wants to partner in the Saskatoon area. Nature Canada wants to help us make this happen. So, there are some more options for you to look into if you're interested in further resources and further action. And I think with that, we're coming up on 8.30. So, great questions, great discussion, excellent presentation. We'll have it up on the internet again soon. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Thank you for everyone for coming. Uh, I will be closing down.